So my name is Mike Souter. Hi. Thanks for sticking around for my talk. Um, I'm going to be telling you about filmmaking for engineers, just because I was an engineer, or I still am an engineer, an aerospace engineer, and I went through this whole filmmaking process. i got to stand here and be a camera. Oh man, I love to walk around. This is going to be terrible. All right. Uh, so first I want to start with this, with this quote up here on the top. It's uh, Robert Rodriguez, you might have heard of him, he's a pretty famous director. He did uh, Once Upon a Time in Mexico, Desperado. And he says, technical people, however, can never be creative. It's something they'll never get. And of course, to you know, all the creative technical people, we say yes. Uh, but we still understand that there's just sort of a, a dichotomy there, that uh, there is this assumption that if you're a super technical person, you can't also be creative. Um, and I've had to deal with that quite a bit. So I, I, it feels like I have a secret identity. See, on one side, I'm very technical. I've got a mechanical engineering degree from Caltech. I've got aero-astro degree from, from Stanford. Yeah. Um, we, we can't see it. So, like, feel free to move around. I think the only reason I said that is because the light sort of ends here, so we can't see your face. Oh, okay. But if you move around, we can see more slides. So, <laughs> okay. that's good I'll start, yeah. you know, taking, taking, yes. taking strolls. <laughs> um, yeah, and so I, I also, uh, I worked on my PhD, but don't ask me when that's going to complete. We'll just say it's on, her, on permanent hold. And then seven years in industry at a defense contractor. That shall remain nameless. Um, and, but then on, on, on the other hand, and, and that's my day job, but then, you know, uh, the, my Cape Crusader mode, I'm also this creative person. I, uh, some people might not know that at Caltech, Humanities is the number one um, required type of course at, at Caltech. And so you have to take that more than you take physics, more than you take math, and all that, all that sort of stuff. So I would always try to load up on creative writing courses. Um, and what, turned in, what started as short stories over the time became scripts in about 2009. And then finally last year I decided to take the plunge and actually make Make a film myself, so I've got a. Uh, we did a. We put together a Kickstarter trailer, and it's running right now. And I hope to show you a clip of it uh, here later if we have some time. So, I, I guess as I was trying to break into into Hollywood, it was, and I would tell people my background. Everybody would be just flabbergasted. Oh my God, you, you're you're an aerospace engineer. You are an actual rocket scientist. You can you can do all this sort of stuff. But how how do you write scripts? Uh, but it's not like there haven't been scientific people that are you know pretty famous. And uh, here I just have just a number of them. I think my favorite on this slide is, is Dolph Lundgren. He is uh, in The Expendables. He's this big, you know, cheesy action star. Um, but some of you might not know that he also got the Fulbright Scholarship to MIT to study chemical engineering. And he, he quit to go be a movie star. And so uh, here I just have just a ton of people who, uh, who have done it. So it's not, it's not so crazy, yet uh, there's still the, the, the stigma, or I wouldn't call it a stigma. There's still this notion that uh, really technical Technical people can't uh, can't can't be this uh, as as creative, and so like I like I mentioned before, I started out writing, and so I'm, what I'm going to try to tell you is how I use my technical uh, expertise. I'll, I'll try to sneak over here. I see somebody trying to look look at Mr. Bean there. Um, how I use my technical expertise to inform the filmmaking process and see if there was any way I could improve on uh, on, on what I was do what I was doing. So first, uh, I'm going to start with screenwriting. And I got to give you a little bit of background. I mean, um, you'd be surprised to know that screenplays all have a standard structure. Most of the time, when I tell this to people, they laugh like, "Oh yeah, there's everything that coming out of Hollywood is the same crap." Uh, but no, it's actually just as humans, we, we like hearing stories a certain way, the beginning, middle, and end. No surprising. Um, but there are books and books dedicated to the structure of screenplays. And so, of course, you know, when I started out, I read all of those, and you get these nice graphs about what the action should be and uh, and, and how it should resolve. And so that seemed right to me to, you know, can I do some data on that? So when I wrote my first screenplay, I decided to, you know, see where I fell on that. Um, and so what I, I call these the whammo charts, but it's basically you sort of rate your uh, the scares, the laughs, or the action per page on a scale of one to ten, and you do it for the entire screenplay. So here we see my first my first script, Deadhead, and in blue you have my my, my estimation of, of my whammo chart. And you see it's all over the place. It doesn't look anything like what it's supposed to be. Um, so I, you know, I have to get another data set and start averaging. So I got my wife to do her, her version of the whammo chart. You see hers is just as crazy as mine. You try to average them, you can almost get a, a trend line going. But, but still, is there, is there a formula for the perfect screenplay when you come over here again? Uh, the answer is no, and if there was, I'd be writing a book on it and enjoy the pantheon of, of screenwriting books. Um, it's just that the, the, the subject is too subjective. My, my 10 on my whammo chart might not be the same as somebody else's 10. 
and I just need so many people to read it and give me this data so that I can then average it and get a nice trend line that uh, <laughs> this method just doesn't work. And it turns out that beyond a few people, it's hard to get, it's hard to get somebody to read a script without paying me. So <laughs> that, that, that's sort of where that one, that one stopped off. Um, but then, like I said, you know, I've been trying to write screenplays for a while, and then finally I just decided I'm going to go for it. And so that meant I got to see what it's like to be a producer. So through a series of unfortunate events, my producer, he got a real job, and so he had to leave. And so I had to take over producing. And the problem was I had no idea what a producer does. Does anybody know what a producer does? I think you ask anybody who's not a producer, they say no, just because it, it, it's so amorphous. I'll, other than they get all the money, that's, that, that's what they do. Um, what they actually do is they find or they buy an idea. It either comes from themselves or they find it, they purchase it from a screenwriter, and then they beg, beg for money from investors, and then finally they get to spend all that money hiring anybody and everybody that's uh, um, involved in the production, and schedules and, and, and locations and all that sort of thing. And so whenever I was forced into it, uh, I'll just move over here, um, there's something we do in engineering, it's called decision matrices, which look like this. Uh, I could have gotten even more fancy and gone with the QFD, which is quality function employment, but that's just getting crazy. So, <laughs> so what I did is just these simple decision matrices. That's where you have your options across the top, and the way you rank them are your attributes that make those options good uh, along the side, and then you weight those attributes which are more important to you, and then you go through and you rank your options based on those, uh, uh, those attributes. And then you, you do some math, and I hope this all adds up because I just did it really quickly and without a calculator, and uh, you find the best one. So here it'd be actress B, assuming I did my math properly. Um, but this is just really a formalized way of thinking through the problem, and, and one of the ways that you can can help you inform your producer decisions. Um, the next was directing. So here's actually a picture of me on set in my, my zombie horror movie. The problem with directing is also I had no idea what to do. So what does a director do? According to Google Clip Art, you sit on a chair and you shout it through a bullhorn. And so I could do that, I thought. Um, but it, it turns out that it's actually it's much more difficult. It's, the director is, is the leader. He's got to communicate his particular vision of, uh, of the screenplay and how it's going to turn into a film. He's got to lead the team. And the most important of all, he's got to, all those decisions the producer did, he's got to make them Times a million, and it's got to be quickly, like on the order of seconds. So when, a, when a, the lighting guy says, oh, the lighting's not going to be good here uh, in 30 minutes, but we're still trying to finish up this shot, should we go from this one to that one? What do we do? You have to decide instantly and, and make, make everybody aware of that decision. So what sort of technical skills did I use as a director? Um, there was a number of times where we were filming in this really tiny apartment. This is a very tiny apartment and it didn't have a very good electrical system. And so when you have, I don't know how many watts of lights rigged up, you're gonna blow a fuse. And so outside of some, some light engineering fixes like that, I didn't really get a chance to use anything uh, that particular that was you know, unique to, to my technical background. Um, at, uh, at, at my defense contractor company that shall remain late in those, I do a lot of team leadership, and so that was just like that, but only on steroids, and for 13 hours, when I never got to sit down. So it was a, it was a pretty, pretty fun experience, and that, like I said, there were just some minor things that actually uh, carried over. And so the, the, final, the final stage of the movie production after directing is editing. And so uh, if people have ever edited a, a movie before, they, they'll look at this, this picture of Microsoft Movie Maker, and they'll even laugh at me or weep for me, because this is a terrible program to edit with. Um, so whenever we actually filmed the trailer for, for my zombie horror film, Hunger, I actually paid an editor to use a professional program. But then when I wanted to do a blooper reel and a shorter trailer, I had to figure out how to do all that myself because we didn't have any money. And so that that's going to um, Windows Movie Maker. But I think this one out of all of them felt the most like uh, some, something technical. It felt like programming. It's, you got to line up everything just the way you want it, just like a program, and then you can, you can sort of see a preview of what it's going to look like in this window here, but then you have to render or compile everything before you can see the whole thing. And so it, it, it gave that feel that was, uh, that was really interesting. Um, and then the one headache, and the one place I think there could be some innovation is, so we've all heard of Pandora and the Musical Genome Project, where if you tell it you like this, uh, this song, it'll recommend a number of songs for you. The problem is all those songs are, they, they, they have copyright and you can't really, you have to pay a lot of money to get the license to those. So when I recut the trailer, 
there was a perfect, really sad piano song that I wanted, but of course I couldn't get the license. Um, and then I wanted to search for, how do you search for sad, piano, slow, uh, melancholy? You do that in all the, the, the search engines out there, and you get a, just a ton of, of stuff that pops up. And I had to listen to every single one, none of them were any good, and none of them fit what I wanted. I would have I killed for somebody to have expand like a Pandora-type experience to the, the free music that a lot of artists just post online. Uh, but it's just it's very hard to search. Um, and so, like I said, it could use innovation or it could use expanding uh, the musical genome project. And so, uh, so, and, uh, so, so like I said, so that, that's sort of uh, editing is the final step in post. And then you get an actual, uh, you, get, you get something finished. And I'm going to try to play this for you. Um, I'll give you the director's behind the scenes commentary because I don't think we're going to hear the sound very well. You can, uh, you can hold the mic next to the. I don't know if it works well for me. Uh, yeah, I can sort of hear, but I, I think the director's commentary would be, would be better here. Whoops, whoops, I did something wrong. All right, come on. So, okay, it's, it's nice and blurry. So, so uh, I, I warn you all, there's going to be blood, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it. Uh, but if you can hear it, there's this nice melodic piano music going on. I actually did find a good one. Um, but we're in this bathroom filming, and it's, it's incredibly tiny. And what you don't see is there's like seven people off screen. There's a huge light over the bathtub that's roasting us alive. The door is closed. There's no ventilation. And uh, my actors were great. And yes, that's a real knife that he's, he's you know, about to try to do some stabbing. And um, oh, but by the way, the premise of the movie is that uh, this guy's girlfriend gets infected, and he's trying to decide. He's, he's wrestling with the decision. Does he end it, or does he do something else? And so, uh, as you're going to see, there is going to be a, a stab scene, and we had some, so many problems with the blood. So, you imagine this actress, she's lying down here, there's a tube of blood running into the bathtub, up her pant leg, behind her back, and into a neck wound that's, that's been super glued on, oh, that's been super glued onto her. And so whenever we do the stab, you can see it kind of sprays out, that's because this is the third take, and it was our last take that we could even have done. And it took, uh, it took three takes because up. There was, first we had too much pressure, and, uh, or first we had too little pressure, and so the blood just kind of dribbled out. And then the second time we had too much pressure, and the, the, the valve on her back just exploded, and she was just drenched in blood, and we took us an hour to clean the bathtub. And then the third take, we had just a little, we were trying to find that happy medium, we had just a, just a little bit too much, and so it came out of this big spurt at the beginning, but then it just kind of looped, looped like I, I wanted at the end. And so it was, a, it, was a, it was a very crazy experience making a film, and, and did any of my uh, any of my technical knowledge pay off, or, or did, I I don't know. As, as, as soon as uh, as soon as we actually make the full thing, then then I can tell you. But uh, that was just the experience and how I tried to apply my technical know-how to filmmaking. And that's all I got. Are there any questions? Yes. So it was actually funded by me and a friend of mine. So uh, a friend of mine who. We knew I'd been writing scripts for a long time, and so what we're doing is we, we funded a Kickstarter trailer. So if you go to uh, this one, if you, if you if you go to the Save Rena link, which is the name of the, the character's girlfriend, uh, you can see our Kickstarter, and uh, it's, it's not looking good. But uh, we need we need a million people to to donate. Um, but yeah, so we funded our idea is to fund a Kickstarter trailer to try to get enough funds to film the full thing. And so if we don't hit our goal, um, we do have plans. So. That, we set our goal, I think, too high because we're trying to do it all very professionally. So we actually have a, a film crew from LA that we're going to hire, a professional editor and all that sort of stuff. But if that doesn't work out, we can always just go super, super cheap and actually go you know, buy a camera for Best Buy, like, like that one right there, and uh, film the entire movie on that. Because we are trying to go for this found footage look. And so we actually use a found footage type camera. And, you know, we got the look. The only problem then is uh, the, the sound doesn't work. So that's where, if you've ever seen a found footage movie like Paranormal Activity or Blair Witch Project, they always cheat on the sound because the crappy sound just ruins the movie experience. And so we would need to get one of, one of those cameras and a good sound kit. Yes? So Eric uh, Jacobus, J-A-C-O-B-U-S, runs Stunt People, and they make uh, action martial arts films. And he just bought, he, he, he 
just bought a Sony camera for fifteen hundred dollars, which she called Sony's gift to low budget filmmakers. Yes. Well, the reason I you probably know which camera I'm referring to. The reason I mention it is maybe if he's in between films right now, maybe you could like rent it from him. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So he's in Berkeley. Yeah, so we, we can either, so I think that's that's one of the, they call it the prosumer, and it's like right at the gap between, it's not the super expensive Red Epic, and but it's it's better than, you know, one that you buy from here. Um, and so the idea would be, like, uh, if we decide to go super cheap, uh, either renting it, like you mentioned, or we can, we have enough money in the budget to actually buy one of those, one of those level of cameras. Right. Um, okay. And then, yeah, then, like I said, the, the, the real problem is, like, uh, whenever you're doing a, a, a horror movie like this, you actually make a lot of your, especially a movie that's going to be video on demand probably first and then selling uh, DVDs online. Um, you really want to get the international market. And so you have to have two separate audio tracks, the voices and then everything else, so they can dub over the voices. And so a lot of uh, uh, indie horror flicks don't do that. They can't do the international stuff or they get much less money for the international stuff. And it just doesn't make any money and they don't make the second movie. And so. Well, that's the that's the, if we decide to go that route, that's the one thing that I'm worried about. Yes. Uh, first off, that is awesome. I like I, I am a, I'm a huge fan, and I want to write scripts one day. So seeing the fact that you can do this is like it's really cool. Oh yeah, that's fun. It seems everyone I tell about it, they're like, you know what? I should write a script. <laughs> and so it, 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 it's contagious. So uh, watch out. Uh, like zombie, like zombie, uh, zombie viruses. And the one question I have is in the in the in trying to like, it seems like your presentation is like, this is what uh, people who do filmmaking do, right? And if I start here, if I don't sort of have all the deep training of like making films, and I start with my engineering knowledge, how can I like, you know, how much of this can I reproduce? And one, one provocative question is, like instead of trying to reproduce that, what if you were to make a film that brought all of your engineering knowledge to use, right? Like what if you made something no one else could make because they don't know how to do lighting that well, or like they don't know how to do like, I don't know, like, Field and you made a film that sort of like played on your strengths as well. Well, so yeah, yeah, I definitely under, I, I, yeah, that, that's a good question, and it's, uh, you know, can I can I make it? Can I use my my expertise to make it totally unique? And you know, I hope so. So 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 given you know, I guess given the constraints of, of this script, maybe not because it's a little found footage thing. But you know, we could we could do that on on the future scripts. But um, I think one thing that in, in, I guess in screenwriting that makes my scripts, I guess not unique, but very informed by my technical know-how is, uh, you know, making things make scientific sense. And a lot of a lot of movies just just <laughs> throw that out the window, and there's this fine line between just making something that's totally ridiculous scientifically and that is a good story. And so I think I can make the decision better as to you know this is just this just doesn't make any sense at all. Versus, we need the story to move, so I don't care if they can they can run DNA in ten minutes versus two hours like it takes. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna make that sacrifice and go forward. Uh, one one little interesting thing that I did change for this script is uh, the 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 science behind zombies and in particular the population dynamics. So normally in zombie movies they like to come they eat you they're gonna eat your brains. There's nothing left to reanimate, and so very quickly they're gonna die out because there's gonna they're gonna reach a critical mass and that's it. So you're not going to have the huge millions of hordes taking over Atlanta like you see in, in Walking Dead. And so I actually included in my in my script an explanation for that. So my zombies, number one, they eat anything and everything they can, which is something I, I don't really realize why zombies, you know, they, they limit themselves to just humans and other and other movies. But uh, I also have another way to get infected. So not just the bite or the blood infection. Uh, you can actually just randomly get infected. So there's this another. Uh, it's not really randomly, but you have to watch the whole movie to, uh, uh, to see it. Um, but there's another way to get infected so that you can maintain that population exponential growth. And so I don't think anybody else who's written a zombie movie has actually done the math on population dynamics. Um, so we'll see if, that's, uh, <laughs> if, if that makes it better or not. I don't know. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Thanks a lot for sticking around. I appreciate it.